doing hypothesis testing. And today's session as well, it's a very long one. So I'm hoping if we're not done by half past four, we can continue until five o'clock, but we will see how far we get as well. Okay, so what we doing for the next one hour, 30 minutes, we'll be looking at hypothesis testing for the mean and the proportion, and this is towards helping you being able to submit your assignment for. Next week, we will do more activities because I realized that also this week and last week, we didn't do a lot of activities. So at least next week, it will allow us more time, one hour, 30 minutes to do activities from both uh, study units as well. And then the last uh, week of August, we will do question and answer session. Are there any questions before we start with this week's session? Is there anything that you want to ask? Or are you all good? I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Cool. In the absence of any questions, then that we can continue. We're going to look at um, firstly at the hypothesis testing for the mean. Uh, and later on, we're going to look at the hypothesis testing for the proportions. By the end of the session today, you should be able to learn one of the basic principles of hypothesis testing that is very important to know that and how to use the hypothesis testing for the mean to make a decision and also how to make use of the hypothesis testing of the proportion to make a decision as well. Okay. Oh, oops. My heading is still says confidence interval, but this is hypothesis testing. With hypothesis testing, we're still going to look at two um, uh, sections. Hypothesis testing for the mean and hypothesis testing for the population proportion. And when it's for the mean, we need to also know that uh, the population standard deviation needs to be known or it can uh, uh, be unknown. In that case, then it means they have given us the sample standard deviation and how do we handle all three of them and how do we create, uh, do a hypothesis testing of all three scenarios as well. So what is an hypothesis testing? A hypothesis testing is a claim that a researcher wants to prove. Um, <clears throat> as a researcher, you will have a question that you want to answer, and that question you can state it in a hypothesis testing a statement. And <clears throat> always, when we want to prove something, we're always going to be using the population parameters. Therefore, it means in your hypothesis testing statement, you are always going to use the sign relating to your population parameters. Like for the population mean, we will use the mu as our, in our statement. And for the proportion, we will use the pi for the proportion. <clears throat> when we state uh, the hypothesis testing statement. Now, because the researcher wants to prove something, there is always a case to be proven in a way, right? It's either you are guilty or you are not. It's either something is true or it's not. So with hypothesis testing, there are those cases. So with the researcher statement that they want to prove uh, or we want to test, we always going to have an opposite of that statement. So we will have two sides. We will have what we call a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, which will be the alternative of a null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis is the statement that the researcher wants to prove, and the alternative is just another, or we can say it's the complement of that statement. 
if this if your researcher statement is not true, therefore it means your hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis will be true. And the way we state the null uh, hypothesis, which is the researcher's claim, it will always contain an equal sign to it. So for example, when we want to prove that the mean diameter of the manufactured bolt is 30 millimeters, therefore it means we will say the mu is equals to 30 millimeters. We do not use the sample statistic symbol. So we always use the population parameter symbol and not the sample statistic symbol. <clears throat> With your null hypothesis, we always begin, when we state the null hypothesis, it always um, begins with the assumptions that the null hypothesis is true, which is similar to what I just referred to, uh, whether you are guilty or you need to be proven guilty or not. Uh, always, like I said previously, just to reiterate on this, it always, in the null hypothesis, always has an equality side. So you will notice that sometimes when they state the null hypothesis, there's always an equal sign. They don't mind the, the sign of greater than or equal or less than or equal. But when you state your null hypothesis, there should always be an equality sign to it. So always your statement will contain equal, less than or equal, or greater than or equal. But generally, we can use just the equal sign statement. <clears throat> Your null hypothesis may or not or may not be rejected. So when we make when we get to the end of the session, uh, once you have done all your testing, then you need to make a decision. You when you make a decision, you can either reject the null hypothesis or you do not reject the null hypothesis. And that's how you will state your hypothesis. What is very important um, in the null hypothesis is that you, when you make your decision and you conclude, you always refer back to your, hypothesis, your null hypothesis statement. Number two, the other thing that is very important with the null hypothesis is the statement you write on your, alter, your, your null hypothesis statement, especially the parameter. It's very important that you use the right parameter when you are, are stating your null hypothesis and always your null parameter will correspond with the value of that parameter as well. Looking at the alternative, which is a complement of a null hypothesis, this is the opposite of that null hypothesis, right? If we stated in the null hypothesis that the mean diameter uh, will be equals to 30, the alternative will say it is not equals to 30 millimeters. Always. <clears throat> what I also didn't mention with uh, how we state the null hypothesis, we used a subscript O or subscript, subscript zero. For the alternative hypothesis, we use the subscript H1. Some books or somewhere they use HA, some books they use HC. Some books they use um, <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, it's it's either they use H A or H one or H C, which is the complement. <clears throat> Your alternative hypothesis testing always does not contain an equality sign. So it means the sign will be not equal, less than, or greater than. Those are very important. These statements in your alternative hypothesis testing, they are very, very important because they will determine where you're going to find your critical value. They will determine what type of a decision you're going to be making with and it, they will determine the type of test you are doing whether is it a one tail test or a two tail test and based on that information it will tell you whether you do need to find two critical values 
we know we remember what critical values are. We did find the critical values in the last uh, exercise uh, study unit that we did with uh, confidence intervals. And it will also help us with the decision because if our if we're doing a two tail test, then it will help us to know in which site are we making the decision to reject the null hypothesis and the alternative. Only the sign in your alternative hypothesis is that important to that effect. That is why in your null hypothesis, whether you put a greater than or equal or you just put an equal sign, it will not matter that much than when you do your alternative hypothesis. The statement you put there is very important. Now, some people might ask, what if the researcher wants to prove that it is less than? Remember? The statement that the researcher wants to prove is uh, has to have an equal sign to it. So if the researcher but wants to prove less than, we're going to use the statement of the researcher in our alternative hypothesis. And when we make a decision, if we go into reject the null hypothesis, we will be rejecting the false null hypothesis and those will create some errors and we will get to that just now. Your alternative hypothesis, we do not even have to worry about proving it, whether it's right or wrong, because we always, when we make a decision, we refer back to our null hypothesis statement. Right. Like I explained, uh, when the researcher wants to prove a a less than, they say the mean diameter is less than 30, because we cannot put it in the null hypothesis, we can only put it in the alternative hypothesis testing, then when we make a decision, we are going to create an error. Because if we reject the null hypothesis, then we are rejecting a false null hypothesis. We're not rejecting the true null hypothesis because the true hypothesis that the researcher wanted to prove, we placed it on the alternative. So we create what we call a type one error if we reject a true null hypothesis. So for example, most of the questions that you will get you will be rejecting a true null hypothesis because if you get to the decision where you are rejecting the null hypothesis and that is what the researcher wanted to prove, then you will be rejecting a true null hypothesis. Like for example, with our null hypothesis that stated that the, uh, the, uh, the mean is equals to 30 millimeter. If we reject that null hypothesis, we are creating what we call a type one error. And the type one error is considered as a serious type of an error and the probability of a type one error is always going to be referred to the, as the alpha value or we call, we call that a level of significance. So when we do hypothesis testing, we are always going to find that um, uh, level of significance to use to find our critical value so that we are able to make a decision to see whether are we rejecting the null hypothesis or not. And your level of significance or your alpha value, it is set by the researcher at the beginning. So they, they will tell you that test at 95% confidence interval or test at 95% interval. You need to remember that your confidence level of 95% is the same as one minus alpha, and you can find your alpha from there. Or you need to remember that a 95% confidence level is equivalent to the level of significance of 0 0.05, 0 0.05. We create a type two error if we fail to reject a false null hypothesis. So for example, like I did say, if the researcher wants to prove that the uh, the mean diameter is less than 30 millimeter, and we put it in the um, alternative hypothesis, therefore our true, um, our hypothesis testing, sorry, our null hypothesis will state that 
the mean diameter, if that one was less than, the mean diameter will be greater than or equal, or we can just say the mean diameter is equals to 30 millimeter. And if we if we do not reject the null hypothesis, then, then we are committing a type 2 error, which is failing to reject the false null hypothesis. And this is denoted by a beta um, value, which is a type 2 error probability. Okay. <clears throat> We're now going to move into how do we then do the hypothesis testing. So we're going to look at how do we apply what we just learned now to state the null hypothesis and to use the level of significance. How do we make decisions? So we're going to look at uh, hypothesis testing for the mean and we're going to look at when the population standard deviation is known, therefore it means we're going to somewhere to calculate using the Z test or using, we're going to find the critical values on the Z table, or we're going to use Z table at some point to do all this. And we are also going to calculate what we call the Z test statistic, which is what you have learned in sampling distribution. And we will get to that just now. We are also later on going to look at testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is unknown when we use the t test remember to go find the critical value on the t table and also going to be um, introducing a new calculation which um, is similar to the z test from this sampling distribution z formula but using the t test and then we're going to learn how to make a decision Okay, so let's first start with hypothesis testing when the population standard deviation is known. You will need your calculator, your statistical table, and the formula to remember this. On top of it, you need to know the steps of the hypothesis testing. And I'm going to tell you all the steps because they are very important that you know all six steps of hypothesis testing in order for you to get the questions right as well. So like I said, we're going to look at hypothesis testing for the mean. And when the population standard deviation is known, we know that we're going to use the Z table. And when we calculate the test statistics that we're going to use to find either the probability value, or we're going to use the Z test to make a decision using the Z test and the critical value, we will use the Z test, which is similar formula that we have learned and we worked with in study unit seven in the sampling distribution. And now we just, instead of that only Z, we put subscript stat to show you that this is a Z test statistic which will be given by your sampled mean minus the population mean divided by your standard error, which is your population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Now, the other thing before we forget, always remember that your questions in the exam or assignment, they might not give you the symbols. They will give you weights, you need to know how to interpret the word into a mathematical formula or function or symbol. For example, if they ask you that it exceeds, you need to know that it's greater than. If they say it's fewer than, then it's less than. If they say it's no less than, it is greater than or equal. If they say it's no more than, it's less than or equal. If they say at least, you need to know all those weights. If they say um, it is greater than or equal, it should be easier to find and uh, the symbol that relates to that. So you need to always constantly remember all this. If you can't remember them, have them saved somewhere that you can always come back to them and refer back to them when it comes to the sides, right? Okay, so now 
when we state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, the sign that sits on the alternative hypothesis, it's very important. It tells you whether, what type of a test are we doing, and it also helps us to find the critical values, which also help us to find the region of rejection for us to make a decision. So for a two-tailed test, your null hypothesis will state that the mean is equal to 30. Your alternative will state that the mean is not equal to 30. Immediately you put the not equal to 30 and the alternative hypothesis testing, you know that you are doing a two-tailed test. Therefore, it means you will have two regions of rejection. Therefore, it means you will have to find the critical value by dividing your alpha value your critical value, you will find it by dividing your alpha value by two because you will be splitting it into two uh, regions of rejection. When we make a decision, because now we, I always like to write or draw this very same graph that you can see here. I always draw the belly curve uh, shaped graph, which is the normal distribution graph. And I highlight my regions of rejections based on the critical value that I would have found on the table. So if I use the Z table, I will find the critical value. If, for example, it was for 0, 0,95 uh, a level of significance, or oh, sorry, not level of significance, but the, uh, the confidence interval, which means my alpha value would have been 0, 0,05. And therefore, I'll take my 0, 0,05 and I will divide it by 2 and I will get 0, 0,0250. And I will go to the table to go find my critical value of 1,96. When I find that critical value, I'm just going to use it 1,96 and it will be on the negative side, it will have a negative. And on the positive side, it will have a positive value. And this will be my region of rejections. Anything that falls above or below, so this side it will be below the critical value, I'm going to reject. Anything that falls above the critical value, I'm going to reject. So when we come to the decision, this is very important because it helps you to visualize where your areas of rejections will be. Anything that falls in between the two critical values, we do not reject. What happens when you have a one-tailed test? So when you have a one-tailed test, it is when you have only one side of where you're going to do your rejection. So for example, if your hypothesis testing states that your, especially your alternative hypothesis testing, it states that the mean is less than three, therefore it means we are going to have our region of rejection in the lower side. So the sign is very important. It will be in the lower side. And you will see how we state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. You can see you can either use greater than or equal in your null hypothesis, or you can write it as your mean uh, is equal to three and your alternative will state the mean is less than three. As long as it has an equal sign in your null hypothesis, that's fine. The most important sign is what you place on your alternative hypothesis because that will tell you where your region of rejection is. And when we find the critical value, because it is a one-tailed test and it's one-sided, we're going to find our critical value at 0, 0,05 at one, we don't divide our critical value by two for a one-tailed test. It's always going to be alpha value and we go find the critical value of an alpha value. When it's in the upper tail, it will say it is greater than, um, and your alternative can, your, sorry, your null hypothesis will say less than or equal, and your alternative will say greater than, or you can say your Null hypothesis is equal to three. Your alternative will state greater than, and then your region of rejection will be in the upper tail 
area, which means once you have your critical value of 1,96, and on, on this one, if our critical value will not longer be 1,96, it will be something else. Uh, at 0, 0,05, you will find the critical value for that, and it will you then create your origin of rejection, and you will make your decision. Anything that falls below, you do not reject. Anything that falls above the critical value, you reject. So now let's look at how the steps now comes together. Okay, so there are six steps that you need to know and always remember. And this statement or these six steps can either be the options in your question. For example, option A, B, C, and D, or option one, two, three, and four, can be one of these statements. So the first step of doing a hypothesis testing is to state your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. And I've shown you how to state your null hypothesis and alternative. Remember, null hypothesis always contains an equal sign. Your alternative, which is very important for your sign, it has no inequality or it does not have an equal sign. Step number two, you need to choose the level of significance. State whether are you is this the um, uh, for hypothesis testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is known or unknown. You need to also state your uh, your your sample size, and you need to go and find your critical value. That will be step number four. Okay, so you need to find your level of significance, which is your alpha value. Step number three, you need to calculate or determine and calculate your test statistics. So now, if you found that in step number two your population standard deviation is known, then you need to find or calculate your test statistics for Z. If it's unknown, you're going to use the t-test statistic. Step number four, it's very important. If in step number one, uh, step number two and step number one, you did something wrong there, you will get step number three or step number four wrong. Step number four is very important to know that the sign you put in your alternative hypothesis is the correct one because it will determine how you find your critical value. In step number two, how you find your level of significance, it's very important as well that you need to make sure that your alpha value is correct and whether you determine whether the population standard deviation is known or unknown because in your critical value calculation on step number four, where you're going to get the critical values to determine your region of rejection, you will use your alpha value and the sign you got. If the sign said it's a two-tailed test, which means it's e uh, not equal, then you will divide your alpha by two and go find the critical value. If it is less than or it is greater than, then you only use your alpha, you don't divide it by two, you use your alpha to go find the critical value. If your population standard deviation is known, you find your critical value on the Z table. If your population standard deviation is unknown, you find your critical value on the T table. And therefore it means you will need to find the degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom you use your n minus one to find the degrees of freedom so it's very important that you follow the steps because they link to one another and once you have determined what your appropriate test statistic is and you found your critical value in the step number five says you can calculate your test statistic so if we determine that it was a z test then we need to calculate the z-test. If we determine that it was a t-test, then we need to calculate the t-test. And once we're done with that, then we can come to step number six, which is to make a decision and conclude. When making a decision, we make a decision by using the critical value and your test statistics. So you need to make sure that your step number three is correct 
there was sorry step number four is correct and step number five is calculated correctly because then you will use both of them to make a decision and you make a decision referring back to your null hypothesis state testing uh, or statement to say whether you reject the null hypothesis or do not reject the null hypothesis. Very careful. In the hypothesis testing for your module, there are two statements that you make. You, or you will say, we reject the null hypothesis, or you say, we do not reject the null hypothesis. No other statement you need to make, like for example, we may not, we are not rejecting, we, the way you state it, we reject the null hypothesis, or we say we do not reject the null hypothesis. That is the format that you will need to use when you're stating your conclusion. Right? Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's test the claim that the true mean diameter of a manufactured build is 30 millimeter, and here yeah, I'm going to say at 95% confidence level. That is the case. So let's test this hypothesis. Remember our six steps. Step number one is to state our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. Stating the null hypothesis, our mu is equals to 30 because the statement said, test the claim that the true diameter of the uh, manufactured bolt is 30 millimeter. If they could have said, it is greater than, then I will be doing something else. If they said it is less than, then I will be doing something else because the statement said is, it means it's equal. So the null hypothesis states the mu is equals to 30. The alternative will state that they are not equal to 30. So your mean is not equal to 30. And this, because of the sign that I put or I have placed on my alternative hypothesis testing, then it means I am doing a two-tailed test. And that is very important because it tells me when I get to the critical value, how, um, how am I going to find that critical value? When it comes to the rejection areas, it tells me that I'm going to have two regions of rejections. Okay, step number two, specify the level of significance and your N and what you are given, for example, whether the population standard deviation is known or not. So yeah, looking at the statement, the population standard deviation is given, so it's known. My alpha value is 0, 0,05. My N is 100, right? Step number three, finding your, or oh, determining what type of a test is this. Based on the information, population standard deviation is given. So therefore, I'm going to assume that we're going to be using our Z-test because when the population standard deviation is known, we use the Z-test. Step number four, determine the critical value. So now with step number four, we do the same. Remember, at 95% confidence level, it's 0 0.05. So our alpha value will be divided by two. So it's 0 0.05 divided by two, which means it's 0, 0250, we go to the table to go look for 0, 0,0250 inside the table, and we go out, it's on 1,9, and we go up 6, and therefore our critical value is 1,96, and because it is a two-tailed test, we're going to find plus or minus because it will be on the negative side, and on the positive side. And immediately from here, you can draw your, your graph and say, and say they will be my regions of rejection. So anything that falls here will be rejected. So this will be 1,96 and this will be minus 1,96. And there are my regions of rejection. Anything that falls here, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Anything that falls here, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So now we need to find our Z test before we can say we are rejecting the null hypothesis. Step number five, we compute 
the z test statistic so our z of the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n which gives me our sample mean is 29.84 and our population mean it's always stated in the hypothesis so it makes it easier there it is it's stating our population standard deviation was 0, 0,0 uh, 0, 0,8 and our n of 100 square root of 100 and we calculate this and we find that our z test statistic is minus 2.0 so where is minus 2.0 um and we know that here in the middle here it's zero so minus two will fall somewhere inside the shaded area so it will be somewhere that side because it's minus two your numbers increase as you go to the left in terms of negative numbers in terms of positive numbers they will increase to the right so minus two falls in the rejection area and then now we can go and make our decision so that's step number six step number six there is our region of rejection based on our alpha value of 0, 0.025 uh, 0, 0.05 our alpha value of 0, 0.05 because there are two sides we divide it by two which is 0, 0.025 and then we go and find our critical value of minus 1.96 and positive 1.96 and we create our region of rejection and we found that our test statistic is minus two therefore it falls in the rejection area and we can say um our z test of minus 2.0 is less than one uh, minus 1.96 so the test statistics is in the rejection area and we can conclude by saying since the z test is equals to minus 2.0 which is less than the critical value of z uh, minus 1.96 we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is sufficient evidence that the mean diameter of a manufactured build is not equal to 30. And that's how we make a decision. Let's Look at another scenario when we look at rejecting then or doing the hypothesis testing for Z when the population standard deviation is known. Now here, the catch is that we are going not to use, we are not going to use the critical value and the test statistic like we did here, but we're going to use the p-value. Remember what the p-value is? Um, the p-value is your probability value, that is the value you find inside the table. Like your alpha value, you said it's a probability in the table. The p-value will also be the probability we're going to find on the table using our z test statistic. So it means this answer here, which is our z test statistic value, we're going to use it as our z value on the Z normal distribution table in order to add for us to find the p-value. And this is only applicable for Z uh, hypothesis testing. Only when we do Z test hypothesis testing. So uh, later on when we do um, proportions, because we also use the Z, we can find the p-value or we can make conclusions based on the p-value so now how do we do that so when we make a decision using the p-value if your p-value is less than the alpha value we reject the null hypothesis and if it's greater than or equals to alpha value we do not reject the null hypothesis so always remember if p-value is lower 
the H naught must go. The null hypothesis must be rejected. Okay, so how do we do this? Also, we have the five steps that you, the, 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 the four steps you know of, and then we added the step where you just need to go and find the P value instead of finding the critical value. We remove the critical value step. So you still do, you, you can still state your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. You still need to know what your level of alpha is because we're going to use our alpha value or our level of significance to make a decision. And you need to know what your sample size is. You need to know, know what the test statistic is, is and how you calculate it. <clears throat> so we, we only state here yeah, that it's a z-test statistic, and then you calculate the z-test statistic. And once you have calculated your z-test, the answer of your z, you're going to use that to go find the p-value. Now, what is very, very, very important as well here, yeah, there are two things. If our alternative hypothesis says two tail test, how we go find the p-value, there are two of them. So we're going to find the p-value, but you're going to add them, mul multiply that by two. The value you find on the table, you're going to multiply it by two. If it's less than or greater than, the value you find on the table will just be your p-value, right? Here is the catch. Remember, how we dealt with normal distribution questions. If the alternative hypothesis, right? If the answer there it is less than, then it means your p-value will just be the value you find on the table, right? Yippee, that's good, that's great, that's perfect. If it is greater than, Always remember, will be one minus the value you find on the table because remember that the table values are always the probability of Z less than. Because our P value is a probability, we always need to keep that in mind. Now, coming to the place where it is not equal, where you have to take both two P values and add them together, you need to pay attention. If your Z value is positive, or let's start with negative. If your Z value is negative, if it's negative, if your Z value is negative, then you can say two times the table value. That will give you your P value. If your Z test, if your Z value is positive, you're going to say two times one minus the table value. And that's how complex it is when it comes to the P value. But if you can get this right, it's, you can get everything correct. So these are the ways that you're going to find your P value and make a decision based on that, right? Always remember that. Always, always take a picture, take it, memorize this, because when you do your practice examples and you need to be able to know all this. Okay. And then the last step, we make a decision and conclude. So we're going to use the same question that we had or the same example. I'm not going to go through each statement again the same way you state your null hypothesis and alternative. We know that we're doing a two tail, so therefore it means our p-value, we're doing a two-tail p-value. If it's negative, we're going to just take the value on the table, multiply it by two, and pop is your angle. Uh, if it's positive, then we're going to do all these other calculations in between. Okay. So we go and we simplify, or we specify alpha value because we need that. We remember in our conclusion, if the p-value if it's less than alpha, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So it's going to be very important because our rule states that we need the alpha value. Okay, 
and we assume that the population standard deviation is known because they told us and we're using the z-test and we calculate our z-test and we did find that our z-test is minus 2.0 and then oh before i come to that slide let's wait right here so because it's 2.0 so what did we say when it is minus it's minus right the value we find on the table we're going to multiply it by two so we need to go to the z table and go find minus 2.0 so we come here minus 2.0 and zero at the top and the answer is 0 0.00228 so this is only on one side and this must be applied on both sides remember our critical value we say this is uh, not this not like not in, this is minus two uh, uh, sorry positive two and minus two on this side and we found that this probability here is 0 0.0028 right oh two two eight um zero point two two eight and zero point zero two two eight so because there are two of them we're just going to say two times zero point zero two two eight which will give us our critical our p value so our p value our p value will be the combination of the two the multiplication of the two so let's see two times what these two times 0 0.0456 0 0.0456 and that is our p value you can say two times that or you can say 0 0.0228 plus 0 0.0228 it will also give you the same 0 0.046 they will give you the same thing and that's what we do here so you can say two times or you can say p value it's zero plus oh, 0 0.028 plus 0 0.028 or you can just take the value you find on the table multiply it by two and that will give you your p value and then we can make our decision since the p value of 0 0.046456 is less than our alpha value of 0 0.05 we therefore reject the null hypothesis because there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean diameter average E or the average diameter of a manufactured bolt is not equals to 30 millimeters. And the same conclusion that we used or we found when we were using critical value in the Z test is the same as when we're using the P value and the alpha value. So you can for only for Z, only this is only applicable when we're using the Z test. We can use either the critical value and the Z test to make a decision, or we can use the P value and the alpha or level of significance to make a decision. Now let's move on. Unless if there are any other questions. I had an exercise, but based on the time, I'm thinking now. Okay, let's take this five minutes to do this exercise and then we will move to the when the population standard deviation is unknown and then we will do the proportion so in the if uh, this exercise if in a sample of n of equals to 20 selected from the population so the sample of 20 the sample mean of 58 and the population standard deviation of 12 suppose that the e twitter wants to test the following hypothesis the null hypothesis which states that the mean is equals to 55 versus the alternative which states that the mean is not equals to 55 at alpha 
or at the level of significance of 5%, which one of the following statement is incorrect? To start with, we just need to highlight what we given so that it makes it easier. So I'm given N, I'm given the sample mean, which means it's my X bar, the population, oh, there we go, that is my sigma, my population standard deviation is known, I can make reference to that right now, is known, and my hypothesis testing, in the hypothesis testing, I'm given the population parameter, which makes life easier, and my alpha value is 0 0.05. Okay, now, I'm not going to look at the options. I'm going to do the hypothesis testing step by step. So step number one, number one, we state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. I don't have to state that because they already did that for me right there, right? If they didn't, I would state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And looking at my alternative hypothesis, I know that I am doing a two tail test, right? That's what I know. Number two, step number two says, state what else you given in terms with relation to your alpha, which is 0 0.05 and your N of 20. And I know that my population standard deviation is known, right? Step number three, if my population standard deviation is known, then it means I'm doing a Z test statistic, right? Because my population standard deviation is known. Step number four, uh, step number four was uh, finding the critical value. So now let's go find the critical value. So finding the critical value, we're going to find the critical value by using Z alpha of 2, which means it's Z of 0, 0,05 divided by 2, which is Z of 0, 0,025. 0, and I know that this is 1,96 because we used it previously. I don't have to go and show you again, which is that value, 1,9 and at the top 6. So it's the same thing. So that is my critical value and step number five. And on step number five, then I'm, I, I need you guys to help me to find the answer because I didn't open my calculator today. So we need to find Z equals the, uh, the mean, sample mean minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Now, I'm going to take a detour a little bit because I can see that I'm asked to find the standard error. So I'm going to ask you guys to calculate this manually and give me the answer for the top and the answer for the bottom with this exercise. So at the top, our mean is 58 minus our population mean is always stated in your hypothesis testing which is 55 divided by our standard deviation is 12 divided by the square root of N is 20. Now, I want you to give me the answer for the top part. 58 minus 55 is three. It's three. And the bottom part. Then at the bottom, right. do 12 divided by the square root of 20. 2.68. 12 divided 12 divide by tw square root of 20 is 2.68. How many digits? You must not cut off. 6832. 32. Does it end there? No, there's quite a lot. Yeah, but you are cutting me. Like, I want all the digits. I want okay. to know. 0.683288. Then it means if we leave it, yeah, if we leave it to four decimals, then it will be 3683. Because three. I'm looking at the answer here, it's four decimals. So you need to pay three, attention four. to the information given to you to leave three. your answer at the end. 
to, uh, relating to the number of decimals that you have, right? Okay, so then let's calculate this and find the actual. So just take three divide by that value. 1,1180. 1, 1, 1, okay. Right. So that is step number five. Step number six, we need to make a decision. And making a decision, we can make draw our normal distribution graph. And we have our critical value, right? It was 1.96. So 1.96, and it will be negative on this side. And on this side, it will be 1.96 positive. Anything that falls this side, we're going to reject. Anything here, we're going to reject. And otherwise, if it falls in the white area, we do not reject. So now let's go and find out. So based on this information that we have, no number five, our critical, our Z test, or maybe I forgot to also put there. Stat, you can also put stat, or you don't have to put stat there. Uh, so where does 1.11 fall? It falls in the, on this side, right? In the do not reject area, right? Because this is one uh, 196, and this side is minus. And if I have a zero at the at the be here in the middle then it will fall somewhere on the side of zero, on the right-hand side of zero, uh, in, still in the do not reject area. So, do not reject the null hypothesis, and we can blah, 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 confirm that. At the level of significance, blah, blah, blah. So that is based on the critical value, right? Or we can also base the decision on the uh, p-value. So I'm I'm, just, I'm taking it one step because we don't need we don't have the p-value there, but I'm just taking it one step. So we have our z. We can go and find, and because it's positive. Uh, to go find the p-value. So our p-value. And we're doing a two-tailed test. This is positive. Then it means we're going to say two times one minus the value we're going to find on the table. So on the table, we need two decimals. So it will be 1.12, right? So we go and find one on the positive side of the table we're looking for 1.1 and at the top it should be 2 because we're looking for 1.112 where they both meet which is 0, 0.8686 One minus zero comma eight six eight six. What is the answer? Zero point two six two eight. Oh, sorry, I multiplied by two already. You already? No, it's five. Um, zero point two six two eight. Zero point two six. Two eight. Okay. So our p value, remember the rule. The rule says p value. If it's less than alpha, we reject. That was the rule. So our p value is zero comma two six two eight, which is greater than zero comma zero five. Therefore we do not reject. You can see that the same results, we do find the same results. So now we can come to the question and answer. Which one of these statements is incorrect? So number one says we're using a two-tailed test. That's correct because we did determine that it's a two-tailed test. Number two, 
says the standard error is 2,836. We did find that standard error. Remember that this is your standard error, right? So our standard error was 26833. Our test statistic is 1.180. We did find that it is 1.11. Number four, H not is rejected. We say we do not reject, so therefore, this is the incorrect statement. The critical value is 1,96, which means that is correct. As you can see, here yeah, I'm just demonstrating to you to say all six steps, because we used all of them. We used that step, this step, this step and this step. So you need to know all the six steps of hypothesis testing in order for you to answer the question, because if this was a question in the exam, then you need to be calculating all six steps in order for you to find which one is incorrect or which one is correct. And that is hypothesis testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is known. I just demonstrated as well, how do we find the p-value? when we get the answer of a positive, right? Okay, now let's move on to hypothesis testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is unknown. Are there any questions if, before we continue? Okay. No questions, then we can move on to the next one. Okay, so with the hypothesis testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is unknown, we use the T test statistic. And it's similar to the Z test statistic. Remember the Z that it was the population mean minus or sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error. And because we had the population standard deviation, you can see that since we are not given the population standard deviation, we, are give, we will be given the sample standard deviation. Therefore, we're going to be using the sample standard deviation there. So that's the only difference. The formula is the same. Um, the other thing that will be different is how we find the critical value. Okay. So we're also going to follow the same six steps. I'm not going to repeat them. We've touched on them. And this is an example. The average cost of a hotel room in New York is said to be 168 rand per night. For uh, To determine if this is true, a random sample of 25 hotels was taken and the result in uh, the mean of the sample mean of 172 rand 50 and the standard deviation of 15 rand 40 test the hypothesis at alpha of 0 0.05 now read you need to make sure that you know what you are given by reading the question again so that you understand what is there so here it says the average cost of a hotel in a room is said to be 168 they didn't say it is less than, it is greater than. Those keywords are very important when determining the sign you will put in your alternative hypothesis. And because none of those kind of words are used, we're going to assume that this is a two-tailed test because then it's an equal and our alternative will be not equal. And this is how we will state our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis based on the statement given. So we're going to be doing a two-tailed test. So the first thing we do, so because they also gave us, oh wait, I must go back, our N, N of 25, we are given the mean of 172, Point fifty. We are given S, which is the sample standard deviation, S of 15 rand 
40. And they are asking us to find this at alpha of 0, 0.05. So that is very important um, in the uh, information that we have. So now let's do our six steps of hypothesis. Step number one, stating the null hypothesis and alternative. Step number two, state what you are given and also calculating the degrees of freedom because we know that we're going to use that in our critical value. So our degrees of freedom, it's n minus one, which is 25 minus one, which is 24. <coughs> our population standard deviation is unknown. So we're going to be using T test. And this is step number three. Step number four, we need to go and find the critical value. So finding the critical value, remember we use alpha and uh, the degrees of freedom. And because we're doing a two-tailed test, so it will be alpha will be divided by two. So that will be 0, 0,0250. And that is why the critical value there is 0, 0,025 and 24. Remember to go to your T table. Critical values of T and 24. And remember to ignore the top part, only the values closer to the table are the values that we are using. So you go to 24 and 0, 0,025 where they both meet. And that will be your critical value of 2,0639 which is our critical value. And we calculate our test statistic, which we substitute the value, the mean is 172.50 minus the mean, the population mean, which is always given in your hypothesis testing, which is 168, divided by the standard error of the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of 25 which then the answer gives us 1,46. And because we have our critical value, we can create our region of rejection and our 146 will fall within the do not reject area because our critical values are minus 2.06 and minus and plus 2.06. So, 1.46 falls in there, do not reject area. And we can conclude by saying we do not reject the null hypothesis and there is insufficient evidence that the true mean cost of every of different, uh, the true mean cost of the hotel is different from 168. And that's how you do a hypothesis testing when the population standard deviation is unknown. I do have for the upper tail. So this one is another example. So a phone industry manager thinks that the customer monthly cell phone bills have increased and now averages over, has increased and it averages over 52 rand per month. So over, it's greater than, and that is what the researcher wants to prove. The company wants to test this claim. So now, because it says over, it cannot be on their null hypothesis. It will be in the alternative hypothesis. So then you will create a false null hypothesis. And because it is a over, it will be greater than. So our null hypothesis, we can write it this way or you can just leave it as equal. It will still be the same. So your <clears throat> null hypothesis will state that the mean is equals to 52 rand or is not over 52 rand. And the alternative will state that the mean is over 52 or it's greater than 52. <clears throat> and we can state what then alpha value of 0, 0, 0, 0,10. <coughs> Sorry, I've been talking a lot. My throat now is eh, not responding. <coughs> Just give me a second. Uh 
OK, so we are given the alpha value of 0, 0,1 and our n of 25. We know that we can find the, uh, the degrees of freedom, which will be 24. So our degrees of freedom will be 25 minus 1, which is 24. And because this is a one tail test, remember, we only have greater than. So it will be in the upper side area. So our alpha of 0, 0,10, we go to the critical value table and we're looking for 24 and 0, 0,10 where they meet. And that will be our critical value is 1,3178. And that is our critical value of T24 and 0, 0,10, which is 1,3178. So, which is 178. That's what we found. Come on. With me. One seven eight. That is our critical value. So from our region of rejection, critical value, we decide the site will be do not, with our rejection area. And anything that falls in the white area will be do not reject area. <clears throat> and we then now can go and calculate our test statistic using the information provided and we calculate our test statistic and we find that it is 0, 0.55 now remember the table um the sorry the critical value we found was 1.318 from the table and now our test statistic is 0, 0.05 and therefore we can determine where it will fall and it falls in the do not reject area and we can conclude we do not reject the null hypothesis since the test statistic is equal to 0, 0.55 which is less than or equals to the critical value of 1,318 therefore there is not sufficient evidence that the mean bill is over 52 rent and that's how you make a decision i also have an exercise my worry is if I do this exercise, we won't be able to do the proportions. Let me get your feeling. Do you want us to carry on up until five? But my throat now is refusing. It, it's, it's fighting with me. What are your take? Must we continue until five? No response. So I'm not gonna do the exercise. We'll just we'll just move on to we'll just move on to the proportions because we only left with 10 minutes. So <clears throat> they are hypothesis testing for the proportions. Uh, with the proportion, we're only going to deal with when the uh, your expected mean or your your expected mean or your variance is more than five. So in your module, you don't have to worry about the others. So you just need to worry about doing hypothesis testing for the proportion. You don't even have to test that scenario, the assumption. So we're going to use, for every hypothesis testing for the proportion, we're going to use the Z-test statistic. Also, the Z-test statistic that you have learned in the sampling distribution um, study unit. We're going to use it here and call it a Z-test statistic. So all, also remember, like with the previous ones, if you are not given the sample proportion, you will be given observation that satisfying that satisfy that sample and you can calculate the proportion. So you will be you should be able to calculate your P 
by using your x divided by n. <clears throat> and our standard error, we're going to go back. Remember, in confidence interval, we were using the standard error using the sample proportion um, to calculate the standard error. We're going back to sampling distribution, study unit seven, where we use the population proportion to calculate the standard error. Right. Yes, you get an example. A marketing company claims that it receives 8% response from its mailing. To test this claim, a random sample of 500 were surveyed with 25 responses. Test that the alpha <coughs> is equal to 0 0.05 level of significance. Now, what are we given here? We are given the population proportion. And we are told, so we are given the population proportion because the claim is that they're receiving 8% of responses back. And they did a random sample from the 500, which is our N. They had our, the response of 25, which is the X and the alpha value of 0 0.05. And to test this claim, the six steps of hypothesis testing. The first one, we state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Step number two, we're going to state the alpha value and the sample size. We're going to determine the test statistic and the sampling distribution. We're going to find the critical value from the Z normal distribution table and decide where your rejection area and non-rejection areas will be. We're going to compute your z-test statistic and we're going to make a decision and conclude. You can see that all the hypothesis testing that we just did, uh, gone through, they apply all the same steps. So you need to know all six steps of hypothesis testing. So because here we're also dealing with the z-test, you also need to remember that you can be asked questions to also use the p-value for making a conclusion and the decision. So now let's test that. The first step, stating the null hypothesis and alternative. The mean, uh, the proportion, population proportion is equals to 0 0.08. The alternative population proportion is not equals to 0 0.08. Therefore, we're doing a two tail test. Our alpha was 0 0.05 given, N is 500 P. We were told that we have 25 out of 500, and we calculated it was 0 0.05. Critical value, because it's alpha of 0 0.05, and we're doing a two tail test, our critical value will be 1.96 because it's Z alpha over two, which is set of 0 0.025, which is 1.96. Our region of rejections, we identified them. Can then calculate our test statistic. Our P was 0 0.05, we calculated it because it was 25 divided by 500. Our population proportion was given in the now hypothesis statement is 0 0.05 calculating the standard error, and the answer we get for the test statistic, or substituting the values for your standard error, and calculating, we find the z-test is minus 2.47. We can then make our decision and conclude where does two, minus 2.47 fall. It falls in the rejection area on the left-hand side, and therefore, we can state that we are going to reject the null hypothesis at alpha of 0 0.05 and conclude that there is sufficient evidence to reject the company claim of 8% response rate. And that is how you state your hypothesis testing for the proportion. If we needed to do um, the rejection 
or the decision based on the p-value, then, <coughs> then we're going to use our z test statistic of minus 2.47 and go to the z values and look for minus 2.47. And that we will find 0, 0,0068. And based on that information of 0, because it's two side, we can then add them together or we can multiply by, by 2. And that will give us 0, 0,0136. And our p value is less than alpha value. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, in the last three minutes, we can look at this example. We'll go through it step by step, answering each question. Marato randomly selected a sample of 100 children with ASD and found that only 70 of them are in special needs school. So our sample N is 100 and our X is 70. Botali and Mabato are at it once again. This time they want to determine whether the true proportion of ASD children in special needs school in the population is 0 0.75, which is our population proportion pi. Assume at alpha of 0 0.05 level of significance, which one of the following statement is incorrect? Now, reading the question and the statement, they just want to determine whether the true proportion of children in special schools is, because it's just direct, then it means it's an equal. The null hypothesis will state that the proportion is equal to 0, 0,75. Your alternative will state that it is not equal to 0, 0,075. Therefore, this statement is correct. Number two, finding the critical value because we're doing a two-tailed test, and this is a two-tailed test, so it means our alpha divided by two will be 0, 0,05 divided by two, which is 0, 0,0250. By now, because we have been doing this forever, I know that it is 1,96, and therefore the critical value here is correct. Step number three, the value of your test statistic is minus, 0, minus 1,09. So let's find that Z stat is equals to your small p minus your pi divided by the standard error, which is your pi times 1 minus your pi divided by n. Our p is 70 divided by 100. What is 70 divided by 100? Zero point seven. Zero point seven. Zero point seven minus zero point seven five. Divide by the square root of 0 0.75 times 1 minus 0 0.75. Divide by, divide by, our n is 100. You can calculate the whole of it. <coughs> What do you get? I get minus 
what do you get? Same here. Minus. You also get minus one point. Yes, I also get five. minus one. Therefore, that one is incorrect. And they say the p-value is 0, 0.25. We can double check that as well. So let's go and look for the p-value. And the p-value, we use the value we found. Uh, What do you get? One point? Sorry, I think I'm writing it all wrong. Minus 1.154, 1. 1. right? 154. Yes. That's a one. Minus 1. So we can leave it as minus 1.15. So we go to the table and look for. Remove all this. Minus. 1.15 minus 1.1 and at the top we're looking for five as our last digit and that is 0 0.125 0 0.125 so our p value Because it's a two tail, our p value is equals to two times, I forgot, 1251. 0 0.1251, which is equals to 0 0.2502. 2502, which means that is correct, and that's how you will find your p value. And the last one says we do not reject the null hypothesis, so we can assume that the, the rule says if the p value, so because this is the rule, right? That is the rule. It says if the p value is less than the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. Our p value is 0, 0.25, 0, 0.2. Our alpha value is 0, 0.05. 0, 0. So it is greater than, therefore, we do not reject because the rule says we reject. The null hypothesis if the p value is less than that. So we do not reject the null hypothesis that is true. Otherwise, we could have used the critical value. And our critical value is 1.96, 1.96, and 1.96. This side is negative. And we look at our, <clears throat> our, Z value is minus one point. It falls in the do not reject area as well. And that's how you do the hypothesis testing. Likewise, on the notes, I did include some extra additional questions for you to practice and go through the same content. So we do have exercise one where you can look at some of the information from there and exercise two. You can take a screenshot of them and exercise three. I think there are about six exercises. Exercise four. And exercise five, you can always, if you are using the video, you can always pause and do the exercise and then move on to the next one. And then the last exercise was exercise six, which deals with proportions. And that concludes today's session. Let me go rest my throat. And.
Thank you for coming through. Are there any questions or comments? If there are none, then thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you. Have a thank lovely you, Lizzie. Weekend. There we go. Have a lovely weekend or oh, evening. Thank you. Bye. Maha.